So, you know, I want to draw attention to the fact that there's another exam apart from the MCCQE1 and the NAC OSCE. Usually this exam is for candidates who are going into Chair Dr. Ohioma is from um, Montreal. This, this, is, this is an exam for candidates who are going into practice ready assessment. And if you have any question about that, we can take our time later on and dive into all together, there's an exam for people who want to get into the practice ready assessment. So, for example, recently Ontario introduced a practice ready Ontario. Okay. And then um, Saskatchewan also has SIPA as well. And British Columbia has their own practice ready assessment program. Alberta has its own. Nova Scotia has its own. I think that eventually Canada is trying to make it a Canada wide program. So that is what this whole exam is about. And what I want you to expect at the end of this presentation is number one, what to expect on the TDM exam. It, it's, it's open knowledge, but people, a lot of people don't know where to get the resources from. So today I'm going to get into that. Number two, what are some of the candidates' concerns? Number three, we will also review some questions. We'll solve some questions. So let's get into it. How are we going to ace this exam? Very important exam. How are we going to ace it? With no stress and overwhelming study materials. And those who have been to <clears throat> some of our lectures will testify that we do our best to break down everything so that you don't need to go looking at all these big books and all these references in order to get your thing going. So that is all that Metcognito is about, to make the life of the one who is preparing for the exam very simple so that you can really ace this exam and you know focus on getting through this exam with as little as much ease as possible what is this exam all about like what are the things i'm going to focus on so like every mcc exam there's a blueprint and this blueprint is known but people don't understand the blueprint so they don't even know how many questions should i expect which area should i focus on no look the exam is going to ask you just 40 questions. One, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Just 40 questions in all. The exam is just 40 questions. Just so you can count it on your fingertips. So just 40 questions. What are the components or what areas will they place more emphasis on? Number one, you will get 12 questions on medication side effects and adverse effects and drug interactions. So that means that when you are learning for this exam, you need to focus on medication side effects. So you realize that in the CTC, for example, um, every chapter they have, sorry, I don't know what, I, okay, okay, okay. every chapter they have a table at, at the back, okay? Every chapter has a table and it has adverse effects. So when you are studying for this exam, remember that while you are reviewing this book, big book, you are going to be asked 40 questions from this book. And out of the 40, 12 of the questions will be asking you side effects, drug interactions. Number two, 12 of the questions will also focus on chronic medical conditions. So like, you know, what are the chronic conditions we deal with? For example, in Saskatchewan like this, we have four conditions which are on our chronic disease management list, like COPD, okay? Like diabetes, like... Um, patients who have post myocardial infarction, like patients who have, uh, I've talked about COPD, diabetes, and heart failure. So heart failure, COPD, diabetes, if you are talking about chronic conditions, especially in Saskatchewan, that is something we focus on. So if I'm learning for this exam, out of those 12, I'm going to, or out of the 40 questions, I'm going to make sure that since chronic disease management is a huge part of this exam. I will want to also focus there to make sure that I master it. Oh, so please just put your questions in the comment section. I will come to all of them. So someone is asking, what's the name of this big book? The name of the big book is CTC, Compendium of Therapeutic Choices. Okay, Compendium of Therapeutic Choices. This is volume seven. I think so far there is volume nine as well. And when we are about to be finished, I will take you through all that, all the materials you need. Don't worry, I'll give everything to you. And then out of the 40 questions, you're also going to get 10 acute cases. So the acute cases can be 
what are possible cases I can face in the emergency room? Okay, and how am I going to manage them? And then you're also going to get six out of the 40 cases um, focusing on health promotion and illness prevention. So you realize that almost every Canadian exam has health promotion and illness prevention, diabetes prevention, cervical cancer screening, you know, my, all those things. And what are the things you do to prevent diseases from occurring? So please, when you are learning for this exam, focus on these four areas. Number one, acute management. But the point, remember that it is the chronic conditions which carry, which will appear more on the exam. Out of the 40, you are going to meet 12 cases dealing with chronic diseases. Now, in terms of the um, scoring, in terms of the scoring, you realize that safety, because drug safety is important. Remember all the time when I'm teaching Kiwi One, I talk about the fact that in Canada, the basic thing we want to know is, are you a safe doctor? So safe prescribing. And safe prescribing comes with dosing. It comes with, you know, um, all the things which comes with writing a, a proper prescription, making sure that you're not prescribing something which is going to hurt a patient. For example, prescribing like uh, a medication which can hurt a pregnant patient. That is very critical. So cases on safety will carry about 30% of the total mark. And then the chronic disease management as well. So look, if you're able to manage or um, um, master chronic disease management and also master safety, you're almost 60% through with your pre preparation. And then the acute management will take about 25%. And then the health prevention will also take about um, 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 15%. Now, you realize that because we are dealing with therapeutics, the exam will focus basically on two things. Everything, number one, you've got to know like the patient presentation and of course the diagnosis. And based on the diagnosis, two things you have to just learn, pharmacologic, non-pharmacologic. So whether it is heart failure, ask yourself, how do I determine from a question stem that this is heart failure? That's number one. Number two, what are the non-pharmacologic things I need to do for a patient with heart failure? Number three, what are the pharmacologic things I need to do for a patient with heart failure? Number four, if I have a heart failure patient, what medications can I give? Okay, I can give frismide, I can give spironolactone, I may have to give the patient a beta blocker, I may have to give the patient maybe an antilipid medication if the patient has hyperlipidemia. So all these medications I've listed, frismide, beta blockers, Antilipid medications. If I take Fusimide, what are the side effects of Fusimide? I'll list them down. What are there any drug interactions between Fusimide and any other medications which I should know and which is common among Canadian doctors? So if you map up your, your, your learning like that, you take any condition, migraine, are there any pharmacologic options? Are there any non-pharmacologic options? What are the common medications we use? What are the adverse effects? What are the drug interactions? Um, 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 diabetes, are there any non-pharmacologic options? Are there any pharmacologic options? What are the common medications Canadian doctors use? For example, with diabetes, Canadian doctors will go with metformin as the baseline. Then they may use a sulfonyl urease like glyclozide, but maybe for a short time. And in recent times, we have medications like Ozempic, we have medications like um, um, cetagliptin. We have medications, you know, like that. Then if all these don't work, then we may go to um, insulin. Now, if I pick something like insulin, what is the dosing of insulin? What are the forms of insulin? What are the side effects of insulin? What are the drug interactions of insulin? So if I pick something like insulin, I have to know how am I going to prescribe it? And um, what are the, 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 the adverse effects? And you realize that the adverse effects and drug interactions will carry about 30% of the marks of the exam. Okay. And the non-pharmacologic, I'm going to expect more questions in the health promotion as compared to, of course, the, the safety and adverse <laughs> effects. What are the safety and adverse effects of exercise? Come on. You know, so know that. And when it comes to the pharmacologic options as well, Remember that you'll get more questions 
on drug safety, chronic disease management. And you realize that the pharmacologic option will take about 70% of the, so you out of maybe the 100 marks you will get, about 70% of them will, will be focusing on how you prescribe and how you prescribe it. And 30% of that will focus on the non-pharmacologic options. So please, if you're going to ace this exam, this should be your blueprint. This, you should print this out. It should be in your, on your fridge or something. And every day you should be reciting the various medications which go with all these conditions. Okay, good. So when I talk about illness, health promotion and illness prevention, what do I mean? When I talk about acute illness, what do I mean? Someone says they can't hear me. Please, everybody, can you all hear me? I want to make sure you are hearing me before I move on. Yes, yeah. I can hear you. Okay, so one plus, Dr. One plus, please. Um, um, kindly, maybe check your connection, maybe leave and then come back, okay? Okay, good. So let me go back again. Let me continue. Okay. Okay, someone says they can hear me properly. So when we go to health promotion, what are we supposed to know? Remember that there are only four things you need to know for this exam. Number one, the process of enabling people to increase control over their health and its determinants, and thereby improving their health. Illness prevention covers measures not only to prevent the occurrence of illness, such as risk factor reduction, but also to arrest its progress and reduce its consequences once established. So for example, you have a patient who has kidney disease. How are you going to, what medications are you going to give? What non-pharmacologic options are you going to give? You know, that is it. So if you take the health promotion alone, any topic you take, any topic you take, ask yourself, is there a health promotion aspect to this? Number one, number two, acute illness. These are brief episode of illness within the, terms, the, the time span defined by initial presentation through to the transition of care. The dimension, this dimension includes, but is not limited to agent, emergent and life-threatening conditions. So remember, as I told you, when I was putting this thing out there, you're going to get 10 questions. So ask yourself, what are the top, what are some common presentations people may present to a Canadian emergency room that I should know about? That's something you have to know. Then number three is chronic illness. That's illness of long duration. I think all of us understand that. And then safety and adverse events. That is unintended or harmful effects resulting from medication or other intervention. Reactions that may occur in anyone or in susceptible um, um, subjects. So if you go to cardiology, what are the common cardiology medications we use? And those cardiology medications we use, what are the common side effects we know? Furosemide can lead to hypokalemia, can lead to hyponatremia. You know, those are the kinds of things you have to, you have to be focusing your mind on when you are studying. Common things are common. There are certain things which are common among Canadian doctors. And as somebody who is preparing for the exam, you must know that. Then from a, so I was talking about the fact that when you're also learning, you have to just map your learning. This time you're not going to go so deep like the QE one where you are learning all sorts of things. Remember, you're going to solve just 40 questions or 40 conditions. So every condition you get, what are pharmacologic options? What are non-pharmacologic options? Every, every condition, just if you learn that way, it will make the learning very, very simple for you. So um, what are the areas which are going to, which the kids are going to focus on? When it comes to the clinical topics, it is going to cut across so many topics. And when it gets to complexity, usually they, 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 they according to their, their, their own um, PDF, they are going to limit co very complex cases to about just about 10% of the cases, okay? And for the age groups, they will make sure that they bring you cases from pediatrics, from cradle to the grave. So from pediatrics, so the person is about to die. So you, are, you should expect cases from pediatrics, adolescent health, adult health, geriatrics, you know, palliative care. You should expect cases from all these areas. And for the gender, male, female, usually it's split between 40 to 60%. So that's how you should approach this exam. So how am I then with all this information going to ace this exam? How am I going to ace the exam? Number one, like the QE1, you have to provide one answer per line. One answer per line. 
and also provide only the, the, the responses requested. But you realize that unlike the QE1, where um, if they ask you for four and you put five, you get zero. This one, if they ask you for four and you put six, what the examiner will do is that they are going to mark the first four. So if you are writing any answer, make sure that you bring your best answers forward. And as much as possible, don't give more responses than you expected. So if the question says four, give four. Don't give more than four, all right? Number two, responses will be scored in the order they appear, as I said. So for example, if you know your answers and you rather put, like you put, say six answers instead of four answers and out of the six your last two are correct the examiner is not going to look at the last two to give you the mark the examiner is just going to mark the first four points and whether they are correct or not that's that's that, that is it and there are some questions which will come as the answer will be no treatment provide no treatment if the answer is no treatment just write no treatment because no treatment is also an answer all right and um Unlike the QE1, where maybe if you put in a dangerous answer, you are deducted marks. In the TDM, if your answer is wrong or if it's incorrect, you are not deducted any marks. No points are deducted for a wrong answer. How you're also going to ace this exam is that you want to be brief. Be brief as possible. Be brief. Don't you know write elaborately. But if there's something you need to describe and you know, you don't have the right words for it, then you can write a short sentence, but do your best to be brief, okay? And be specific. Don't go saying abdominal pain. If you know that the presentation you are given is appendicitis, say acute appendicitis. Don't go saying thyroid disease. Rather, if it is subacute uh, 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 thyroiditis, write that. If it's hyperthyroidism, write that. If it's a thyroid storm, write that. If it is hypothyroidism, right? That rather than writing just thyroid disease, okay? Now, you will also be tested on, when it comes to the, the drugs, you'll be tested in two ways. Number one, it can either be an actual drug name or it could be a drug class. So if the question says, I have a patient and which drug will you prescribe? If, you, if the question says, which drug will you prescribe? You've got to say either metoprolol or aspirin. But if the question rather says, what drug class will you give? Then you can say, I want to give a beta blocker. So please, that's also another place people tend to, 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 do, to do poorly. They are so excited that they don't even pay attention to the instruction. Is the instruction talking about a drug name or a drug class. The next thing, don't provide time frames or don't provide range, whether it is medication or duration. For example, a patient, a child with who is needing amoxicillin, you know that there are some conditions where you need to prescribe low dose amoxicillin. There are some conditions where you need to prescribe high dose amoxicillin. Now, low dose amoxicillin usually goes from like 40 milligram per kg divided into three do into three divided doses. High dose amoxicillin will go for about 80 milligram per kg divided into three divided doses. So if you have a case, don't write, and you know the answer is amoxicillin, don't write 40 to 80 milligram per kg divided into three different divided doses. No, don't do that. That will be wrong. If that's, if it's amoxicillin you want to give and the answer can either be 40 milligram per kg uh, divided three divided doses or even 80 milligram per kg. Just go with one because that answer you provide will be in the answer stem, okay? To be in the answer section. So don't be afraid to go for one, even if you know it is a range. Number two, there are some prescriptions where at times maybe you may prescribe it for five days or you may go for seven days. Don't write five to seven days. Just go for either five days or go for seven days. So far as the range you're providing or the, the value you're providing is in the range in normal practice, you'll be given the answer, okay? And what about spelling mistakes? If your spelling mistake, if I can tell 
what you are trying to communicate, even though you spelt the name of the drug wrong, you will still be given your mark. Okay, you will still be given your mark. And then someone may ask, what about abbreviations? Sure, the abbreviations you use, if you, we don't encourage that you use abbreviations. However, if for any reason you're going to use an abbreviation, make sure that it is an abbreviation any Canadian medical doctor will understand. For example, in Canada, everybody knows about CBC. CBC is complete blood count. Everybody knows that. So if you write CBC in your exam, sure, you'll be given. But you know that some abbreviations which you may be using in your home hospital back home, whether in Iran, Afghanistan, Nigeria, South Africa, which may not be a common abbreviation we use in Canada. Please, those ones, avoid them. An abbreviation like INR is common. Everyone knows INR in Canada, okay? So that is it. That is it with abbreviations. Ask yourself, is this an abbreviation which is known among Canadian medical doctors? If not, take your time and just write the full name of that particular abbreviation you are going to um, use. Now, what um, resources should you use? So we have a book from the Canadian Patient Safety Institute. Okay. We also have another very important book. Um, it's called The Safety Competencies. That is Enhancing Patient Safety Across the Health Profession. This is also a very important book. And then we also have a, a, a World Health Organization book. It's called International Statistical Classification of Diseases. And in the Alberta Health Service, in fact, I had a copy, but it's at work. There's an orange book. We call it Bugs and Drugs. Very good. And I also think that you can even download it on your on your on your phone as well. So please go to your app store right now. Okay, let's let's try it. Go to your app store. I think Bugs and Drugs is on there. Yes, go to your app store. Okay, and then type in Bugs and Drugs. You can download it right now. This is how it will appear. I already have it on my phone, so I'm just enabling it so that you can you can you can see it. Let me see if I have it here. Yeah, this is how bugs and drugs appears on your phone, okay? Um, let me see, where is it? Bugs and drugs, okay? Uh, can you see it? This is how it will appear. So please download it right now. It will give you all the various, so for example, there's a place called infections in pregnancy. It's a very good, it's a very good reference for this exam. Download it and use it, and you'll even be using it in your, in your medical practice. So please, has everybody been able to download Bugs and Drugs, please? Have you been able to do it? I want to wait for you to do that before we move on. Please, Bugs and Drugs, very, very important. So, okay, go, Dr. Elvis, go to your app store, your app store, your app store, where you download, you know, various, um, various apps and the rest. Go to the app store, whether you are, in, you are using iPhone or Android, and then just type in Bugs and Drugs. Bugs and drugs, bugs and drugs, okay? Yeah, Dr. Froza, beautiful. Dr. Froza has done it. So bugs and drugs, bugs and drugs, beautiful. Please, it's a very important resource. Even when you start practicing, you are going to use it, okay? And of course, our almighty up to date is also there. And then the public health agency, remember that part of the exam is... Sir. Yes, please. How, how, how do you spell it, Dr. Bugs and drugs is B-U-G... This one, okay. bugs and drugs, and drugs. So you just type that in in your app store. You'll be able to download it. And if you're having concerns, let me know. Beautiful, please. It's a very important resource that you use for your studies and you use for your practice as well. And of course, up to date. <laughs> up to date is what we use. And then Public Health Agency of Canada and Canadian Immunization Guide. Why? Why are we talking about Immunization Guide? Because one of the four pillars of the exam is health prevention and health promotion if you remember. So immunization, immunization, very important. Then we also have the College of Physicians of Canada, um, uh, priority topics and key features, priority topics and key features, okay? Now, this, um, up until about, was it three years ago I wrote my exam? Yeah, three years ago, I wrote my exam in family medicine exam, the family medicine board exam. They had just 99 topics, but now, the topics have been increased to 105, okay? 
So let me, let me, let me, if you're okay, are you okay with me to take you to the website and then show you so that you know the, the topics to expect there? Are you okay with that? Yes, okay. please do. Okay, 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 sure. Yes. Okay, 105 topics. So it's called the CFPC um, topics. Okay, good. This is it. This is it. Uh, those in there, I'll also send it in, share it in the, 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 fam, the, the free Facebook group as well. This one. Okay, let me let me just um make it big. This this is what you have to use as a study guide. Okay, so these topics, these are the topics you need to cover: abdominal pain all the way down. Okay, immunization, infections, infertility. So what I'll do is I'll put when we are done with this meeting, I'll put the link in the Facebook group for those who are um in the TDM course and even on, on the free Facebook group as well, so that you can be able to use it to study. So initially it was 99 topics, but now they've made it 105. And I think there's another resource. Let me, let me just look for it here. Yeah, okay, good. I'm going to show you another resource. I don't know whether you can, um, you can, you can, you can subscribe to it, but I'm going to show it to you because it's a recommended resource. So we have Choosing Wisely Canada, and then we also have Canada Medical Association Journal, CMAJ. Canada Medical Association Journal, this one. Like those who are practicing in Canada, every month we get this journal. A lot of the questions come from this journal as well. CMAJ, Canada Medical Association Journal. Okay, a lot of the questions come from this one as well. So I have I have a copy, and this is what the exam body wants you to be studying because, and I think maybe you can also check them out. Let's check it out right away. I've never had to do that because they bring me the hard copy all the time. But let's try it and see. CMAJ. Um, CMAJ. So you can, good, 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 this one. So you can just, you know, be checking it out. So I'm sharing my screen so that you can see it, okay? And then you can go there and be reading the, 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 the articles. The, the secret about it is this. If like if you're going to write your exam in 2024, like those who are going for the exam in January, if I were you, I'll review the 2023 topics. Okay. So you can even assess it online. You can assess it online. So please, this one is very, very important. CMAG. Very, very, very important. Please, are we all on the same page? Don't forget that you'll be getting a recording, the recording of this, so you can use that to review and to know the resources you need. So I want us now to try some questions. So please get ready. Let's try some questions. And don't say, oh, I've not learned. I've not learned anything. Don't worry about that. Let's try. Can somebody read this question for me, please? I need somebody to volunteer and read a question for me, please. Can somebody... I can... Okay, please do that. Please do that. A 56-year-old patient on pantoprazole for acid reflux and currently on a seven-day, seven on day seven of a 10-day course of oral ciprofloxacin for an infection comes in to the clinic with a history of four days of watery, foul-smelling diarrhea. He is hemodynamically stable. What is your diagnosis? Beautiful. Oh, and that's Dr. Janice reading. Dr. Janice, <laughs> Dr. Janice is preparing for her exam. Dr. Janice, how has your preparation been so far? Please let it's me know. Going, it's going well. Thank you, Doc. Thank Good. you for all and of that. She's in Barbados. So yeah, she's preparing for the exam. Very wonderful doctor. Very, very wonderful doctor. In fact, like I know she's going to blow this exam. So what is your diagnosis? Please, can somebody type the answer? Or oh, Dr. Dr. Janice, since you read it, can you tell me what your answer is? Well, I think the person may have C. difficile or some sort of antibiotic-induced um, diarrhea. So C. difficile, why do you say that? What in the question points to C. difficile? Well, the patient has two risk factors for it. First of all, they're on an antibiotic. And mm -hmm. secondly, my reading pantoprazole can also be associated with increased risk of C. difficile infection. So doctors, are you seeing what is happening? You see the way she's putting everything together. So the answer here is C. difficile. So I have a question. Dr. Janice, with the four points, health promotion, acute, chronic, and drug interaction. 
where do you think this question falls under? I think it's acute and I think it's drug interaction as well. Beautiful. So you see, doctors, this is what is happening. Okay, Dr. Janice, will you want to read or someone else who wants to read for us? Any other person who wants to read or you want Dr. Janice to just go on since she's on a streak? Okay, Dr. Janice, please read for us. Let's go. What medications can you prescribe for his, in, for his condition? Indicate mm -hmm. the do dose, root, and dose and root, list three. Okay, sure, please. Everybody, what is the first line medication we use for C. difficile colitis or C. difficile in Canada now? Vancomycin. Beautiful. Previously, it was what? Metronidazole. Yeah. So in the order of things, what is the first medication we use? We use vancomycin. And after vancomycin, what's the next medication? Fidaxomycin. Fidaxomycin. And after fidaxomycin, what is the next? Metronidazole. Beautiful. Metronidazole. So let's go. So vancomycin, 125 QID. Look at the way we're writing it. PO times 10 to 14 days. But remember that I told you, don't put drug or don't put ranges. So if you see the yellow I put here, ranges were written for teaching purposes. In an exam, choose a single duration and stick to it. So if somebody writes vancomycin, 125, QID, PO for, four, for 10 days, that person is correct. If someone else writes vancomycin, 125, QID, PO for 14 days, that person is also correct. All right. And then I should have brought phytoxomycin up, but this question did not say write it in the order of importance. So even if I put metronidazole, 500, TID, PO, this time I should not also put 10 to 14 days. I put 10 to 14 days for you to know the range in which you can prescribe it. Okay. So I can just write metronidazole, 500 milligrams, TID, PO for 10 days. Then I can also write phytoxomycin. 200 milligrams P-O-B-I-D for 10 days, all right? In the exam, remember, please, don't put a ring. Okay, next question, Dr. Janet. Yeah, yeah. Oh, please, please ask your question, sure. Uh, just go back to the next slide. So, uh, yeah. you know, you mentioned earlier about, um, you know, how the uh, dosing and stuff uh, is prescribed. So I just want to know here, is there like any pattern in terms of, uh, can you just write, just like you did with the uh, metronidazole and mm -hmm. um, where like the strains, the routes, uh, then the number of these, or it doesn't matter which one comes first. It doesn't matter. You can write va vancomycin PO 125QID for 14 days. That's also fine. Okay, no worries. Thank you. But remember that this question was asking about two things. It said, let me just go back. It says, indicate... So what medications can you prescribe? That's number one. So in your answer, you should indicate the medication. Number two, indicate the dose and indicate the route. So somebody, you can't just write vancomycin, all right? And you can't just write vancomycin 125 QID. You must write the dose and the route as well. And you can't just write metronidazole. So that, that's all I'm trying to say that pay attention to what the question is really talking about. Okay, so next question. Hey, thank you. Go to grandma, okay? Bye-bye. Sorry, that's my daughter who just came in. So, um, uh, sorry, please, I have a question. Please ask the question, please. Yeah, please. Instead of uh, QID, uh, can we write QDS? Because I'm used to such term rather than, yeah, QDS. QDS, I don't know whether it's very common in Canada. QDS instead of CID, yeah? Instead of that, you can even say four times daily. Okay. Yeah. I've not really seen QDS a lot in Canada. I see QID. Or you can write four times daily. That's also fine. All right, good. So, um, next question. Is the same patient, and the question says, patient inquires about lupiramide to stop the diarrhea. What will you advise? One sentence. What's the answer? What will you say? No. No, okay, good. So, anti-motility drugs are discouraged in the context of C. difficile infection. So you can write it in very, you can say, I will not prescribe it. You can say no. You can say, like, you can write it in any way. So far as you're communicating what you have to communicate. And the question is, what's your next step? Um, after prescribing the medication you decided on in question two, what's your next step? After you prescribe your vancomycin, what's your next step? Uh, oh, yeah, do it. 
What? Rehydrate the patient. Rehydrate the patient. Sure. So stop. You also have to stop the oral sip, right? Don't forget because you can't be giving the vancomycin and the patient is still. Because don't forget that the question says he's on day seven of oral cipro. So yes, they have to rehydrate, but you also have to stop the cipro fluxes. So you see, the exam is very simple, very practical things. Then what could the above condition be prevented? How could the above prevention condition be prevented from occurring? If you face this question, what will you say? Prevented. Any help? Don't administer both together. Don't administer it together. Sure. What else can you do? Remember, there's an illness prevention part as well. What else can you do? What else can you do? Leorizal we can administer. What? Uh, bifidob bifidobacteria or something. What do you say? Leorizal. What? Yeah, this is for sustain um, flora, gut flora. Oh, probiotics. So probiotics, right? So probiotics. Yeah. Probiotics, yeah. give probiotics. Yeah. <laughs> so the patient could have been given probiotics to prevent yeah. this from happening. Yes. So you see, we've used one question: acute illness prevention, and we've also seen one way to answer the question where it says no treatment must be provided as well, just to go through this. <clears throat> so another case. A 46 year old male comes to your clinic inquiring about having a dental procedure. He used to use IV drugs and states that he was admitted to the hospital seven years ago and treated antibiotics for a life threatening heart infection. What will you prescribe for a patient? What will you prescribe for this patient? Amoxicillin. Okay. Two milligrams. Dose and route and the timing. Okay, um, amoxicillin, two gram, uh, one hour before the procedure. Oh, that's Dr. Salwa. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> amoxicillin, two grams by mouth or PO times one yeah. dose. And you can give it, and remember, don't put a range. Please, I put the range so that it is for your learning. But when you are writing the exam, don't put a range. You can give it 30 minutes to 60 minutes before the procedure. Right. Or clindamycin, 600 milligram. Yeah. Uh, PO before yeah. the one hour before the procedure. Yeah. Dr. Salwa, you also prepared yes. for the exam with us, right? Yes. Okay, good. How has your preparation um, been? It's been well, okay. And I have my exam within next, um, in two weeks. In two weeks. Oh, good, good, yeah. good. Good, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> Pray for me. <laughs> You'll be fine. You'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> You'll be fine. Good. Okay, Thank so you. I have another question. That same patient who, is, who uses the IV drugs, your, your patient's allergy list, lit, um, list, allergy list later and realize that the patient is allergic to the, your first line medication. What other option will you consider? So remember that Dr. Salwa said she's going to give amoxicillin, but the question says that the patient is allergic to your first line. What medication will you give? And I think that's when she said that, I'm not going to give them oxygen, but rather I'm going to give clindamycin. So somebody who has had, you know, um, valvular infection, infective endocarditis from IV drug use, their first time medication you want to give for, for that patient, the patient is going for a dental procedure as amoxicillin. But if the patient has allergies to amoxicillin, then you can use your clindamycin. 600 milligrams times one, about 30 minutes or 60 minutes before the procedure. Okay. So that same patient, list two other patients who may need the medication. I have a question. Uh, Please ask. Okay, so the 30 minutes to 60 minutes, do we say 30 to 6 minutes in the exam no, or do we no, just say no. 30 minutes or 60 minutes? Just say 30 minutes or 60 minutes. Remember that I put it there that the ranges were written for teaching purposes. <laughs> in the exam, choose a single duration. So if you write clindamycin, 600 milligrams, PO times one, 30 minutes before the procedure, you are right. Clindamycin, 600 milligrams, PO times one. One hour before the procedure, you're also right. What if I say 45 minutes? <laughs> you're also right. <laughs> <laughs> so list two other patients who may need the medications you provided in cases six and seven above. Who are the patients who may need that? Who, which other patients may need antibiotic prophylaxis before dental procedure? Any help? Any help? With the with the prosthetic valves, 
prostate involved. Well, they in have a history of uh, endocarditis before. Okay. So patients with valve replacement, patients who are six months post congenital heart repair, patients who had cardiac treatment or cardiac surgery with valve regurgitation due to structural abnormal valve, oh, right? Gosh. So this one comes into illness prevention, right? And so in, even in this case as well, we've gone through, this one is chronic, because the patient had the infection endocarditis some time ago. Um, we have looked at illness prevention. We've looked at drug adverse reaction. Okay. Um, let's continue. Please, is the class being helpful to you? I want to know. Has it been yeah. helpful? Good, 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 good. Okay. 20 year old male came to the clinic with a history of stuffy, runny, and itchy nose for the past two days. He has noted yellowish and greenish discharge today. What antibiotic will you provide for the patient? Can somebody help me? 20 year old, runny nose, stuffy, itchy nose for the past two days. Noted yellow is discoloration. Many people do that in Canada. Doctor, my runny nose is yellow. Okay. What antibiotic will you provide? No antibiotic at this stage. <laughs> Good. Watchful waiting. Good. <laughs> Good. Do not prescribe antibiotics. I wish I can shout it. Do not prescribe any antibiotics. <laughs> Remember that I told you that some of the questions, the answer is no treatment. Do not provide any antibiotics. According to Rx Files, the 12th edition, page 100, it says, yellowish greenish discharge is not indicative of bacterial infection. So it is up to you as a doctor to say, hey, I've learned my TDM well. I'm not going to prescribe anything for this viral infection, okay? Good. So what treatments will you then recommend for this patient? What treatment will you recommend? Symptomatic and what? irrigation. No, tell me, be specific. What will you give? Don't just tell me symptomatic treatment. What? Increase fluid you... intake. What? Increase, someone said increase fluid intake. And what else? What else? Increase fluid. Antihistamines. Antihistamines. And Beautiful. Nasal saline irrigation. No, saline, uh, irrigation. saline irrigation, steam inhalation, antihistamines, all those things, you know? Okay, good. So um, I just want to bring everything into perspective again. Remember, I want to go back. The questions you're going to meet. Remember that when you are learning for this particular exam, TDM, not QE1, MCC QE1 is different. This is therapeutic decision-making. You are going to get 12 questions on drug adverse reactions. You are going to get 12 questions on chronic disease management. You are going to get 10 questions on acute cases and acute cases can range from neurologic complications to anything. You're also going to get cases in health promotion and illness prevention, which we've used these two cases to review, all right? And um, you're going to get more pharmacologic cases like drug prescribing cases than non-pharmacologic cases. So it's going to be a 70 to 30 ratio, just to remind you of that. And we've looked at the resources we are going to get. We've looked at up to date. We've looked at, you know, um, um, we've looked at bugs and drugs and all those things. How to write a prescription. Very, very important. Okay, All the time, make sure that these features are there. The dates. Patient's name. Number three, HSN number. So you can just write any fake HSN number for the, for, the, for the patient. And then after that, you write your prescription where you write the drug name, the dose, the route, the duration. And then you have to write that the patient need refills or not, okay? And then after that, you have to put something like a line there and then you sign your name. So please, every prescription write in the exam, Dr. Sawa, yes. especially make sure that it has all these components. The okay. date, the patient's name, the healthcare number, the name of the drug, the do unless they, you know, the name of the drug, the dose, the route, the duration. If the, if the patient is needing, say, refills of, 
I'm loaded pin. Definitely, you need to put refills, so maybe three refills, okay? Then you have to sign your name. So let's try one and see. So just a quick one. Do you have to no, make no, up no. Name, uh, names and HS number? No, no. So the name, most of the time, maybe you, you will be provided the name. So they may yeah. say, okay, Madam Mary Smith. So my exam, my, my thing will be date, September, what's today? 10th, 2023. Um, patient's name, Mary Smith. Oh, let me, sorry, let me, let me just do it this way. Sorry, let me clean this. Okay, good. So I can go here. Um, it can be here. It can be on either side. So um, date is September 10th, 2023. Mary Smith. HSN 52541062. Okay, I'm Oxyslin. Five hundred milligrams TID PO times seven days. No refills. Then I'll do this. Then sign it, and then write my name, Doctor Brony. This is how the prescription should look like. Thank you. This is how the prescription should look like. All right. Now, if you also write, if you also write, um a prescription for an opioid, then don't forget that, for example, after you've done all the things you have to do, after you've done all the things you have to do, so say, if you're writing morphine, just this is just a quick one. Come on. Morphine. 10 milligrams. Kill for each hourly. PO times seven days. Now, since this is a controlled medication, Q4 eight hourly times seven, four times, um, so Q4 eight hourly, that means you give it six times, six times a day, six times, or PRN, let me see, let me add that. So six times a day times seven, what's six times seven? Is what six times seven? 42. Okay, good. So you can write in bracket total, of 42, you write it in words, tablets. And then after that, you write it in this. That's what you put in a bracket because it's a controlled medication. You know? So this is just another one. So if you're writing this for benzodiazepines, you use the same approach. You have, you have to write total number of tablets they should get. If you are writing a prescription for a stimulant like Vivans, um, 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 like all the ADHD medications, apart from atomoxetin, you have to use the same approach. If you're writing a prescription for pregabalin, you have to use the same approach. If you're writing a prescription for gabapentin, so all the gabapentinoids, you have to use the same approach. 